Hello, welcome to Skull RPG Podcast. My name is Dwight Skull. My name is Jacob Skull. And today we're going to teach you how to tell, tell your, your story. story. So this is uh, Jacob again. This is the uh, part two to our previous one where I will be taking Matt and Dwight through a handful of things to see what they come up with. So what I came up with, Matt, and I'm going to be giving you the same one, is D&D setting, but the drow are going to war. Okay, drow are going to war. All right. So, okay, so drow, hopefully you guys have defined the drow, but I'll define the drow really quick. Drow are kind of the racist elves that live in the Underdark. They're fully black. They're primarily run by females, um, highly magic orientated, where the males are mostly fighters, but the females are mostly either clerics or sorcerers. They worship a really big, huge spider-ish god that is pretty nasty. And... Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for the drow. There are factions among the drow that fight each other, which is normally why they don't go to war topside. So you could play this out two ways, where the drow are going to war topside, and they've somehow unified underneath a um, centralized commander. Let's do that one. So the drow have been conquered. Certain of the smaller houses have been conquered and subjected underneath a larger drow uh, influence. So there's kind of like a drow hero. And maybe in the first part of your game campaign, the drow don't even make a, uh, a scene. They don't even show up. Because your, your players, to be very honest, drow are incredibly hard to kill. They all have spell resistance, at least in D&D 3.5. I'm not sure how they play out in D&D 5. But they're, I hate playing against drow. I'll just put it that way. As a spellcaster, they are just a pain in the butt. Because um, every time you roll a spell, you then have to roll to see if you can even get through there, and mm -hmm. like half your spells fail. It's and if you're low level, nothing goes through. So if you're low level, get a sword. Um, as a wizard, <laughs> it's like the worst thing in the world. So here's what I would do. First, first part, I wouldn't even have the drow show up. Um, I would then start having rumors, and rumors circulate that there's a drow leader, and the drow leader is preparing for war. And maybe you see signs and things where they're asking for recruits from, you know, high-level recruits. You wouldn't put it that way because out of game, that doesn't make any sense. But they're looking for seasoned veterans. And the seasoned veterans are going off into the Underdark to fight. And there might be um, a position where after the first um, act of your game, mm -hmm. you've maneuvered them into place where they can... They're basically now to the point where they're high enough level to go. Not full out fighting but certain certain areas on the side and so maybe you start maneuvering your players to this cave complex and this is where they assume or at least where the humans and the dwarves and the elves are, are mounting a defense and that's where they're funneling their people through and so they start to serve in that way now the real problem with this is you're going to have an entire war campaign I'm not a big fan of doing a war campaign the whole time but that was a scenario you gave me so let's keep playing it out so part two is they arrive at this complex, they see how, maybe how badly undefended it really is. And they kind of get the feeling like, you know, we're all going to die if this is the best defense we can put up. So they start to, the players start to go deeper and deeper in. They start doing certain small skirmishes and things of that nature. And you may even have it where they are um, potentially captured in certain parts and they got to break free. They come back with some intelligence. Um, on the whole matter. But what we would do in the middle of the game area is skirmishes on the outside, trying to find more information about where the leader is, what, what the leader's real name is, what clan they came from, um, do they have any kind of personal guards, what kind of personal guards do they all have, and start looking at ways to do infiltration into the drow itself. Uh, another way you can do it is you can spin it political, and they could start making inroads uh, to other drow clans that may not have joined into the fight but are not are taking a stance of not joining you could also do the same thing with the druger because you could start the druger again are the it's the drow but for dwarves mm -hmm. uh the druger um you know you could start trying to line up with the druger and try to have these interesting bedfellows of underdark denizens joining your cause to create an epic grand battle which would lead you into your third act of the epic kind of grand battles um, happening over underground, hopefully. Um, you could also have a couple where maybe they've done some stuff where they have their own way out. They have another, uh, you know, there's always an Underdark 
cave someplace. Every dungeon leads to the Underdark, so uh, which one are they coming out, out of? Hopefully not every dungeon leads to the Underdark. <laughs> it feels uh, like that. <laughs> massive dungeon complex typically might have a way into the Underdark or be really close to there if you wanted one. So you can also have a um, in the middle of that as a, as a, a tension building scene, you could have an explosion of drow and others come out from another location and start hitting the backside of the human capital. So now they at least get to go up topside and see the sun again for the first time in seven months and fight that battle. And I would think about it like a Minas Tirith uh, from Lord of the Rings type of battle where you have, um, you know, the humans have built some sort of encampment. Maybe you would look at it more like the wall from uh, Game of Thrones where they put all their resources in one direction and they have some defense behind them, but not enough to really care. And now that they're being flanked on the backside, life's a little bit more complex for them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, ultimately, you have the third act concluding where they either win or lose the war. Now, this is the fun part. I don't know if I would have them win the war. I don't know if I would even... Uh, I mean, like, sure, potentially they could win the war, but you could also do a thing where... Um, now that they're high left level, maybe they realize that this world is just, it's too late. Like, there's no way out. So they could teleport to a different part of the world and try to amount a defense there. They could gate or planar shift into another part of another dimension and maybe try to get um, angelic help or other sorts of things. Because having an entire world being taken over by evil drow might be enough for some other planes of existence to want to get involved. Or maybe they just flee through it. Uh, you could also do a thing where, which is really fun if you have the players buy in, at the last session, they might be able to get some sort of hopeful artifact or something that might have a chance at uh, turning the tide. They are able to get it back to a you know to a runner, but in so doing, they all die defending that runner to get them out. And then the next campaign, if you wanted to keep playing in that world, would be okay. Now we're you know, three months later, you're a different group of adventurers and you're now tasked with, with kind of running this artifact to the people that matter. But in the in the meantime, you start becoming the people that matter mm -hmm. to then be able to use this artifact to turn the tide. Hey, thanks for listening. And for more resources, please go to SkullRPG.com.